Okay, so uh, I welcome all of you for this week's Wednesday Colloquium and um, I'm glad that uh, we have a speaker from within our own faculty members and um, uh, it's always special if there is a person from the Institute who speaks about it. But before we start, would like to remind everybody that every Wednesday we have this traditional age-old NSF Wednesday Colloquium series, which um, has been very beneficial to, of course, the uh, students of the institute as well as to the faculty members because it brings along um, you know three different aspects of the natural sciences faculty the work in uh, chemistry biology and physics together and uh, we can all learn from each other and that's one of the most useful exercises because it's very niche to this institute so I hope we carry on this uh, so today we have um, a young member from the Department of Chemical Sciences, uh, Dr. Amor Tabos, who joined us almost one and a half years back, roughly. Um, is that correct? Right? Yeah, yeah. One, one, one year, a few months. Okay. And Amor actually um, is a theoretical chemist, um, as well as a model builder, um, um, computationally. Uh, he actually did his um, um, his uh, uh, entire BSMS degree from IIT Kanpur from 2007 to 2012, uh, one of the integrated uh, master students from IIT Kanpur. Then he went to uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he worked with Nancy Makri, um, one of the preeminent, uh, you know, uh, computational theoretical chemists. Um, who has been doing a lot of very exciting work using path integral methods to look at large quantum systems. Um, he did his PhD and, uh, and finished it from, from 2012 to 2017. Then he went to Princeton University where he was a postdoc for almost three years during the COVID era, um, almost locked in his apartment, but um, uh, did some wonderful work uh, independent work almost, uh, which has led to um, the field of quantum dynamics now simulating large complexes which can do excitation energy transfer. So it is part of Amartya's work that has led to uh, some of the very exciting developments which now chemists can use to understand how, uh, in fact biologists as well, how um, energy transfer in reactions you know, reaction center complexes take place. So Amartya is going to discuss the framework uh, of that uh, really frontline effort and uh, talk about the applications of the methods. So Amartya. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. And I would like to start by thanking Jyotish Manda not only for the introduction, but also for um, nudging me and, uh, and encouraging me to give this talk and all the support that I've received over the last year and few months. Uh, so as I was saying, I'm in kind of an unenviable position of being a chemist by trading who knows nothing of chemistry, trying to do a physics problem and trying to apply it to biological systems when I have not really done biology since my 10th grade. So yeah, what's going to happen in the next hour, hour and a half is not in my control. But anyway, having said that, uh, what I would like to discuss with you are certain aspects of energy, excitation energy transfer. <clears throat> now, these are processes which are pretty ubiquitous in chemistry, important in physics, and in biology, they primarily are forming the first steps of photosynthesis. And uh, what we want to do is trying to understand the, the extreme basics, the first few processes of this transport process from a fundamental perspective, uh, because at, at least as far as the scientific lore goes, uh, plants and nature over evolution has been able to optimize this problem of shuttling energy from one part to another beyond anything that we can imagine. And that's something that we would like to learn from, appreciate and understand. However, the challenge is that that is an intrinsically, uh, it's a problem of quantum transport involving many body physics. Now, it's not that we don't know anything. We already know quite a bit. If you look at biology textbooks, which I haven't turned in, to over, in over a decade and a half, we know that within the cells, uh, that there are these chloroplasts with, with portions uh, where 
where the chlorophyll molecules, the pigments, the chroma chromophores are, are uh, encapsulated, which get excited by light, causing a photo-induced reaction, which takes in water and, sorry, uh, which takes in water, giving rise to oxygen in the uh, in the process, producing things like ATP molecules and NADPH, which are used in a separate cycle. Where once again we know the chemistry, uh, whereby carbon dioxide is transformed into sugar and stored as energy. At a grand level, this is pretty well understood. Now, the all the talk of efficiency in uh, in qu quantum transport in biology goes on over here in this green blob of light reactions. So the question that we want to answer and ask ourselves is what happens over here? To that, the standard answer would be, and this is a cartoon, that we have something called a light harvesting complex, which, well, surprisingly harvests light. So it, it, is a set, it is a set of chromophores, pigment, uh, chromophoric pigments, which gets excited when photon falls on it, and it shuttles those photons into the so-called special pair of the chlorophyll molecules. And the special pair is special in the sense that it does not shuttle the en energy excitation energy any further, but it causes the electron and the hole to separate. A charge separation happens, and the electron gets then funneled into the reaction center. So far, so good. Now, the trouble is that nature does not work in little blobs and black arrows. We want to understand how this energy flows, what are the effects that uh, modulate this transfer, what are the important properties that we need to know about. And just to show you how complicated things can get, here are two complexes which serve this kind of a purpose of, of shuttling the energy into the reaction center in different uh, organisms. One is the fenner matthew olson complex, oops, sorry, on the, on the left, uh, which has become a go-to toy, a go-to model system for, for theoretical chemists to study. The other is a light harvesting system. Now, these two have separate uh, topologies, separate geometries. Everything is different. Um, the fenner matthew olsen complex, as you can see, is a trimer, very loosely coupled trimer, where each of these monomers are, uh, are an octomer of, of chlorophyll molecules, and they are wrapped in the cylindrical protein scaffold, whereas the light harvesting subsystem, the one on the right, is a cylinder. And once again, the entire cylinder is held together by, uh, by various proteins. And the cylinder, depending upon the particular organism from which it is taken, can contain anywhere between 18 and, and uh, 16 or 18 molecules of chlorophyll. And these molecules are dimerized. Very different things, but it's important to note that, once again, uh, the uh, the proteins would play a role, and the molecular vibrations of these chromophores would play a role in modulating the transfer as it happens. So this is what we want to understand. That? One of this and one of that, what do you mean? Olson complex. Uh, How many electrons are we talking about uh, describing? Uh, so, so if you think of just one of these... Uh, uh, one of these uh, trimeric units, that would be something like eight chlorophyll molecules. Uh, uh, I, I don't know the number of uh, electrons in a chlorophyll molecule off the top of my head, but yeah, it'll be quite a few given that it, it's a large molecule, right? And that is where what we would do is it's not, we are not going to try to do ab initio theory directly, but we are going to transform it into, into a model and try to solve the model. Right. So, but yeah, the number of electrons would be quite a few. Anything else? Uh, no? Okay. All right. So, if we would like to answer a few questions. Now, the field of quantum dynamics is pretty old. It goes back to the V days of quantum mechanics with WKB, time-dependent WKB, so on and so forth, various classical-based methods. However, a story that I would like to tell you to start it off is a question that had been bothering people since uh, around 2007-ish about whether quantum coherence plays an important role in determining how efficient this transport process is. And there is a lot of controversy. It's a decade-long story, which I will try to compress for you. And I would like to go on to uh, talking about how these simulations can be done, 
how they are done, um, how we can use the tensor networks, as Jyotish Manda was saying, uh, to simulate some of these things. An important question to be answered over here is, can we try to figure out the roots of excitation transport? Now, many people in the audience might be familiar with, with nearest neighbor transport chains, spin transport, or even if you're thinking of something like the Frankel Hamiltonian, the XXZ Hamiltonian, that there can be various chains where the interaction is nearest neighbor. But given the structure of these biological systems, the interactions are typically long distance, and consequently, the transport routes can be varied. So we would like to figure those out. And finally, uh, can we extend these simulations to larger scale problems and we basically see the universe, universality in, this, in these problems. They should not be just limited to these biological uh, systems. So first, I'll start with the story. So coherence, is it important? And is it quantum or is it classical? The story starts with, with, with this paper. It's a path-breaking paper in nature where Graham Fleming's group is able to do a 2D uh, spectrum, 2D electronic spectra of the Fenner Matthew Olson complex, the complex that I showed you, and they observe certain oscillations in the, in the spectra. And they conclude, they hypothesize that, um, and I'll quote over here, right at the bottom of the abstract this wave like characteristic of the energy transfer within the photosynthetic complex can explain its extreme efficiency. Um, in that it allows the complexes to sample vast areas of phase space to find the most efficient path. No, this is 2D optical uh, elect electronic spectroscopy. Yeah. Like just shining light and excitation absorption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, a 2D spectra would be what? I think three pulses, uh, right? Three pulses. So three, three laser pulses. Three okay. Yeah, that kind of an experiment. Um, so yeah, electron spectroscopy would basically be where the 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 light pulses that you're using have have central frequencies which are tuned to these electronic transitions. So for the three pulse technique, all all the pulses, I believe, I'm not sure, would be in that electronic transition range. So they would be UVVs light pulses instead of say IR light pulses for vibrational spectroscopy or something. Okay. I was just asking, you are measuring photons or electrons? You're measuring photons? This would be, at the end of the day, it will be sensing to the photons that come out. Right. Pump probe. Pump, exactly. It, it, yeah, these are, these are pump probe uh, spectra. Right? So do you want to mention what is classical coherence? Yes. So, so the, the point is, uh, at least if you follow this, uh, the, the chronology in which this happened, these people saw oscillations. Mm. And as is, as people are wont to do, if you see oscillations and if you think that something is funny, you will call it quantum coherence. And these oscillations are coherent, obviously. But we all know that even in classical mechanics, you can have coherence. You take a simple harmonic oscillator, if it's classical, it will have these periodic oscillations. A damped harmonic oscillator would, would show damped uh, oscillations. Now, the question that one needs to ask uh, is whether this coherence comes out of uh, quantum mechanics. Typically, quantum coherences are, and the field is kind of in a toss, uh, are basically effects that come because of the off-diagonal terms of the density, density matrix. Yeah. Now, how do you probe that and how do you see that that is the case? That's the question over here. Okay. Right? Anything else? Okay. All right. So, so now, uh, they didn't stop here, obviously. So, uh, during this period, a bit later, um, Ishid Zaki joined, uh, joined Graham Fleming as, as a postdoc, uh, I believe, um, and, and he was an expert in these uh, exact methods called hierarchical equations of motion. And, uh, and Fleming and Ishid Zaki uh, did an extensive, a very thorough uh, study of bacterial chlorophyll dimers all the way up to the full Fenner Matthew Olson complex using model Hamiltonians and model uh, descriptions of how the vibration and the protein couple to the electronics. And they found that in both cases, and there were probably a few other, uh, other publications in between, 
they found that there are oscillations and these oscillations persist into a pretty high temperature, probably close to 300 Kelvin uh, simulations. And thus their conclusion at the end of the day was that a potential role of quantum coherence is to overcome local energetic traps. And this is over here, right at the bottom, uh, local energetic traps and aid the efficient trapping of electronic energy by pigments facing the reaction center complex. So at least it seems like a settled problem by the end of 2009, but come 2012, uh, Bill Miller, uh, models, uh, things like that. These the models are, that they were solving? Yeah, more coarse grain models. No, no. These So these are models at the level of uh, molecules, like tight binding model. Yeah. Right, and you have uh, excitation hopping between the yeah. tight binding models, yeah. and then you're describing the local energetics okay. with some spectral density. Okay. I'll fine. come to that. Fine, fine. Okay. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> so, so just to say, uh, they were using a Jude Lorentz spectral density over here, local Jude Lorentz. So, <clears throat> what Bill Miller points out, and this is to GRK's point over here, that uh, coherence, maybe quantum or maybe classical, it's not easy to tell them apart, and not just that. Um, he claims that when you have electronically non-adiabatic processes, these are processes which involve multiple uh, Born-Oppenheimer surfaces, uh, then uh, whether coherence effects are classical or quantum depends upon which specific aspects of the process is being probed. Now, this is an extremely nuanced point of view. And just to show that this is true, what he did, apart from other uh, model calculations, was to take Sorry. Can I ask a yes, quick please. question, yes, maybe before you yes. explain this? Uh, just um, um, just a quick question. Yes. Why do we care if uh, there is a classical or quantum coherence existing in such a rapid process? Yes. If, if that question is clear, I think then right, uh, it right, would be right. easier for... So, so at that at this point of time, somewhere around by the turn of the decade, right? people were assuming that uh, we know that plants are efficient at shuttling these excitons through. We don't know why they are so efficient. So the assumption was once people figured out that there are these wave-like oscillations, the assumption was that, hey, you know what? It might be quantum magic at it, right? So we want to understand at this stage whether it is quantum magic or whether it is classical magic. So, and uh, and that is where this publication comes in. And, and basically he shows, sorry, sorry, yes, please. Introduce the time scale in this by saying that the quantum time scale, fast time scales. That's what you said. That since it was a fast, and then you said that the quantum thing helped. So oh, the okay, so the, yes, the time scale is about. So you have these uh, these uh, complexes, right? And the complex is getting excited at say one end, very coarse grained. It is getting excited at one end by the solar photons, and it wants to shuttle these um, these excitons across this entire antenna-like thing and take it to the point where the reaction can happen. This shuttling is happening apparently very efficiently, right? And we don't know why, we don't understand. What is the distance? The, the, the distance, uh, it, it, it varies. It, it varies, I'm not entirely certain, but, but the distance would be different, for instance, in the two complexes that I sh showed. Um, in, in the Fela Matthew Olson, it'll be much smaller, for instance, because there are just eight molecules of chlorophyll. So you can roughly estimate what the distance would be, I don't remember. Uh, and in the other one, whereas you have like two concentric cylinders, one on top of the other. So it uh, the exciton, excitation goes from the top cylinder, which with 16-ish, chlorophyll molecules down to the bottom cylinder and then it goes into the reaction set. Yeah. So so this so the thing is what people know or knew is that this happens very efficiently. And but there was no cause attributed to it. And that is why when they saw these oscillations, they guessed that you know what, it would be quantum voodoo at work. In in in, in 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 the time in the, in the time uh, observable, yeah, the time evolution of the spec of the so the beats, yeah. Was it clear at this point to these people how to relate those oscillation, which is in some time domain spectroscopy, to transport? Because that's not an obvious. That, that's not at all an obvious I, I thing, and I don't think it is that obvious. Okay. That that's simple and that obvious at all. Uh, yeah. Not to delay you for Yeah, no, no, no. But <laughs> because we also made a pact not to delay the speaker uh -huh. first 10 minutes. But you know, quantum meets typically too closely at energy levels. Absolutely. And then decaying. Right. And so they the interference is because they're so close to right, space right. and they have the same right. phase characteristics. Right. Something similar. 
th that would be the claim, but but what has been seen later is that, and that is what I was about to get to, is that, uh, for instance, what Bill Miller shows is that, you know, uh, Ishizaki and Fleming had studied these dimers of mm -hmm. chlorophyll molecules and seen oscillations. What, mm -hmm. what Miller was able to do at this stage was that uh, he could do purely classical simulations. I see. Uh, and and get a identical uh, oscillations, right? And I'll show you the results just now, and you will see that it is better than what, say, an approximate quantum technique like Redfield would do. So, okay. yes, yes, please. Right. Understand this quantum oscillation. So, is Rabi oscillation? Mm -hmm. Rabi would be would be purely quantum, That's for instance. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is what I was talking about to get back to this. So you can see that this the base figure with the what uh, Miller is calling the Ishizaki Fleming model over here with the red dashed line and the red field, which is the blue um, dotted line or whatever. These are quantum methods, right? Ishizaki and Fleming did the hierarchical equations of motion, non-perturbative, non-Markovian, everything, and the other is approximate perturbative. And uh, using using a classical trajectory based method based on what's called the Meyer Miller mapping, um, he could basically get all the exact uh, characteristics. So, we, if you can use classical mechanics to get the same uh, physics, why call it quantum uh, coherence in that case, right? So things were starting to look iffy, and things just kept getting worse. This is uh, 2015, where uh, Wilkins uh, showed that. If you solve the same model, the, the eight, no, the seven molecule FMO model that people knew at that point of time, and you could run something called an incoherent Fiostor analysis on it, which by incoherent you mean you are throwing away the diagonal terms. It's a rate-like equation, and you could use that to solve the problem. And if you did that, then the dynamics turns out to be pretty much having the same time scale. It's not exactly the same, but it's close. So that makes it worse. And you might say that this is just ex uh, theory speaking. Well, experiments uh, happened in 2017. This was uh, a landmark paper by uh, Dwayne Miller's group in PNS where they said that, you know what, uh, they are not being able to see any uh, evidence of quantum oscillations, um, at least at phenomenological temperature, at physiological temperature. So uh, the observed extremely fast, oops, sorry. The where is oh. The observed extremely fast decoherence should be viewed as general, bringing to question any significant quantum coherent transport contributions to photosynthesis. And then they later showed, uh, five years later, that you know what, if you are below 20 Kelvin, which none of the simulations, none of the experiments ever were uh, earlier, if you're below 20 Kelvin, they claim that, you know, yeah, there are oscillations, there are things that look like quantum oscillations, but beyond that, the, the oscillations rapidly phase away, uh, fade away and become irrelevant under physiological conditions. So this is where we are by 2022, it turns out. And uh, <clears throat> I don't remember, so I couldn't put the references there. There was some mathematical physics literature that I was seeing where, where the claim is very simple, that if you have to distinguish between quantum and classical coherence, probably the way to do it is you get the full quantum answer and you try to now think of it as an optimization problem. You try to figure out if there is any system for which the classical mechanics results can give you the same physics. And if you can get close, then it is classical. If you can't get close, it's quantum. But if you say like that, then the point is you have to solve the entire system beforehand. And if you solve it, you already have all the information. So what I would claim is that at this stage, that it is probably Functionally, just a philosophical question whether some uh, coherence is uh, classical or quantum mechanical. As long as you can predict it, it is what it is. If you can find such a system, it's classical, otherwise it's quantum. But right. what do you mean by it is like, okay, so in so reality, okay. everything is quantum, right? And we get right, quantum. right. But here you're trying to talk about whether, so when you say that classical uh, coherence is enough to justify something, the picture that people have in mind is that if I created a classical system, right, is classical mechanics enough to give me all the physics? Because otherwise, as you're saying, everything is quantum, but we understand that for as particles get heavier, as temperature gets higher, all the yeah. other parts would cancel and you will be left with the classical path effectively. So is classical mechanics enough? 
you don't need quantum mechanics. So the question is basically then to rephrase in terms of what Jerry was saying is that, do you need quantum mechanics to see the phenomenon that you're seeing? Or is it enough to just use classical? Yes. Uh, distinction is whether you need phases or mod squares oscillating is enough. If right. mod square oscillating is enough, it can be classical. Right. So, so yeah. So that, that is why, uh, given the scenario, I would like to focus on just being able to predict what the dynamics would look like without getting into a philosophical question of where it comes from and what it is. Yes, yes, please. Yes, please. You know, like looking at transport on mm -hmm. low temperatures mm -hmm. in ordered systems like Pentacene, Anthracene, mm -hmm. has been known for decades. Right. Right. Where excitation at one site can travel, you know, hundreds of sites away and appear there. The difference is that they were all ordered systems and at low temperature where vibrations are quenched and so on. Right. Well, you are living with a real life right. temperature system. That's the difference. That is one big difference. The other difference is I, I do not know these experiments very well, but I'm going to presume just from the way you're describing it that they were held in very carefully controlled environments. Ordered. Ordered, low temperature, low temperature probably not having a large reservoir to talk to. Right, so the matrix around it would be pretty sparse. Correct. Here you have proteins which are kicking them left, right, it's and center. Different. So that is that is a real question. I, yes, I think that is why the the uh, coherence washes away. What yes. Yes. And kind of random, I don't know the order. Of right, right. The phase, each phase may not guaranteed that will be right. No. So not. why do you have to say finally the coherence is left and wave you can see. There is no cancellations of different phases. That, that is the point. I, I believe that effectively all those coherent phases cancel out, leaving only a very narrow band. If you think of the classical trajectory, leaving only a very narrow band across the, around that classical trajectory. It would be almost like a semi-classical approximation, which would give you everything. Because what's happening is everything else is canceling and the neighborhood of the classical trajectory is the only portion that is left, a delta neighborhood. Okay. In a manner of speaking. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. All yeah. right. Okay. So, yeah. So the question is then, how do we simulate such large excitonic systems? Uh, and we want to incorporate the vibrational and the protein environment, the effects of these things in a non-perturbative manner. Sorry. Yes, please. Classical models predict such high efficiencies of, of uh, transport. Um, Semi-classical model studies of, of some of these have been done. Um, and now here is the other little uh, uh, little problem that nobody really calculates. And this is the problem of the field. Nobody really calculates the efficiency. I do think that some of the semi-classical methods can get the correct dynamics. So if the thing is properly parameterized, and if you do semi-classical dynamics properly, you would be able to get it, is my belief. Right. All right. Uh, so, so, to, and to connect your question to this, the thing that the way I want to think about this problem is that semi classics may be enough, may not be enough. But that is a question of exactly which parameter regime you fall in. So, it is better to be safe and go full quantum. And then, yeah, you can compare and you can state whether this is semi classical or not. At least you, you have one fixed point of calculation almost. So yeah, that's what we want to do. And uh, uh, yes, please. In terms of scales, like you know, you have a sense of what the system bath coupling. You're going right, to put right, it in a right. model, so you have some scale. Right. Those things would set some scales about when things are classical, when coherence is on what time scale coherences are going to go away. You right. just put order of magnitude. Order numbers, of magnitude, you should be able. To you see, should, right. Will this turn out to be in that case a classical or decohered object? Or in my experience, yeah. it, it'll turn out to be completely incoherent. In, it will. Yes, okay. I'll, I'll show you some of the data, okay. right? But is, uh, any other? No, that's okay. okay. All right. So I'll, I'll build the model. And just to explain, I'll build it in terms of the phenomatry olson complex. And just to note that this model is very easily extendable to a, a vast variety of other systems. So as I was saying, this is a trimer of octomers. And uh, here you have the octomer where you have unwrapped all the protein nonsense. And the way we want to think about it is as a tight binding model uh, or as a Hutter Hamiltonian, as some people might be familiar. And 
uh, how would that be? So if you consider the first chromophore, uh, since this is an exciton transport, you're talking about two energy levels, the ground state and the first excited state. And the two energy levels would be all that is required per chromophore. So for this, I can represent it as a ground and an ele excited electronic state. And now there is some local chemical environment, be it the molecules vibrations, be it the protein scaffolding kicking the molecule in whichever way it wants to. And that is what I'm going to represent using this brown beige colored uh, circle. And what this does effectively is to make the energy uh, um, a function of the nuclear coordinates. So thus you have two born oppenheimer surfaces and these surfaces are displaced showing the vibronic coupling. And you do the same thing for all the other molecules. And you thus have the model which talks about the local environment, the energy gap between the ground and the excited states, uh, and a hopping parameter which tells you how probable it is to hop from site 1 to site 2 or site 1 to site 7, whatever. Now, if this is the case, then what is the computational requirement like? If you have m molecules, Let's do a back of the envelope calculation. You have two electronic states each, and you are talking about a total electronic Hilbert space of 2 to the power m uh, size. Now, the problem is we are not describing the environment at all in this case. Now, so we have to scratch this up and we have to redo this calculation. You have two electronic levels each. And let's say, and to anybody who does these calculations, this would be completely fictitious. But let us just argue that, you know, you have 10 vibrations per electronic level. 10 vibrational modes, normal modes, let's say. And thermally, let's say you have five of these eigenstates per vibrational level, which are accessible. This is not going to be realistic, but I'm just taking some numbers which are out of the top of my head. And if you, oops, oops, sorry. You have, so you have got two uh, electronic states per molecule? Yeah. And now I'm saying that, let's say, the molecule has 10 vibrations, Yeah. 10 normal modes. And given the omega for the normal mode, let's say you figure out that, you know, five eigenstates are all that is being populated uh, thermally. So your partition function converges at five of these levels. And the remaining five? Uh, the, the re no, 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 no. Ten, the re remaining infinite is not important, right? There are 10 different... Yeah, you only have the first five eigenstates oh, being populated. For Even each if it is of the 10. Each of the 10. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and this is ludicrously small, right? But even with that, what we would realize is that this number of states per molecule would be 2 times 5 to the power 10, which is roughly 19 and a half million. And consequently, if you have M of these molecules, then that is 19 and a half million to the power M. No calculations can be run at this scale. So what do we do? We start to... Oh, so the, the five is... <laughs> Good question. I just pulled it out of my hat. Um, yes. So I'll, I'll treat it as a bath, but I will put in the full feedback. So the feedback would be there. So, feedback would be there in the spectrum. No, feedback would be there in the sense that this would become a full non-Markovian dynamics. Okay. Yeah. That's what you typically mean by bar. Oh, oh, the, 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 you're talking in terms of the something like the Born approximation, where where the thermal distribution remains constant. Born is weak. Yeah, I mean, then yeah. So, are you going to make those? No, no, that, no. So the so bar distribution changes with in. time because you're entangling it. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So um, basically, we would be think. Yeah. Question. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, is there a question? Okay. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll have to speed up a bit. So, 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 so basically, what we want to think of, as I was prompted by Rajdeep, is that we want to think of this in terms of a system environment decomposition, where our observables, at least, are not going to be dependent upon the environment. Okay, so imagine that this rounded rectangle over here is my entire universe. It has the uh, environment degrees as well as the system degrees or the electronic degrees. And as we did the rough computation, the vast majority of the degrees are going to be environment-based. So that's why it's 
th this tiny circle is the portion that I have allotted for the electronic degrees of freedom. Now, if you are going to do a simulation in the full space, um, then the, the, the then the me mechanics, the dynamics turns out to be Markovian. And Markovian means that if I know what the state is at any particular point of time, then that is all that is needed to propagate it by one step. It does not depend on anything in the past. Classical mechanics is Markovian. If I know the phase space, no memory, no memory. So classical mechanics, if I know what the phase space point is at any time point, then I can always propagate it out. Uh, and quantum mechanics is also like that. However, since this is impossible to do, uh, what you would be doing is you will be doing the trace over the, you'll be integrating out the, the solvent degrees of freedom beforehand, leading to what is called a de reduced density matrix. And you have drastically re reduced the dimensionality, but at the cost of incurring some memory. So the, uh, so the uh, dynamics becomes non-Markovian. And that means that now the state at time point n plus one is dependent not only on the time point n, but on n minus one, n minus two, so on and so forth. And as um, Nakajima and Zwanzig showed back in their seminal works, um, this is guided by a non-Markovian memory kernel, which is related with the spectral density once again. But, uh, and, and this kernel generally tends to decay with time. We know that at least for condensed systems. But now what, what is the status? We have got M molecules. We have got two electronic levels each. But now we don't care about any of the vibrations. Uh, we don't care about any of the vibrations. So the number of states per molecule is still two. Uh, you have total number of states being two to the power M. And now the number of states for the entire memory. Now we remember that we can't talk about a pair of time points. We have to talk about a sequence of time points. The number of uh, states becomes something like four to the power M to the power L. Now the two has changed to four because you're thinking in terms of the density matrix. So there's a square dependence in terms of dimensionality. Okay, but this is still something that we can try to do. In a simulation of reduced density matrix, there are various methods, and this is uh, this was what we were trying to discuss. There are approximate techniques which invoke various approximations, starting from Markovian approximation to Born approximation, where the thermal distribution of the reservoir remains unchanged, um, so on and so forth, right? Various master equation-like things. We know a lot of these, and they may or may not be applicable. Uh, and then there is a family of numerically exact methods, the hierarchical equations of motion and path integral approaches being the pre preeminent ones over here. And I will be focusing on path integral approaches because not because they are more efficient, but surely because they, they are at least fundamentally more general in terms of being able to handle system environment interactions. So all right, what are we talking about here? Uh, we have to, un oh, uh, I forgot to mention over here, I'll just quickly go back, that one of the problems of dealing with, uh, with this kind of a master equation is that the memory kernel turns out that that is not a, a uniquely defined, a properly defined quantity. To know the memory kernel, you need to know how the reduced density matrix evolves in time. And to know how the reduced density matrix evolves in time, you need to know the memory kernel. So which came uh, first, chicken or the egg? Uh, therefore, we need a separate uh, way of thinking about it. And, and in the, our case, we will be thinking of it in terms of the uh, path integral formulation. What Feynman and Vernon showed in the early 1960s is that you could imbibe in a, a path integral formalism the entire interaction with the environment. How, how is it done it, it, in terms of a picture? If you have the initial density matrix, rho zero, and you want the final density matrix, Normally, your path integral would be simply an integral, integral over all paths where you add up the amplitudes corresponding to each of the paths. Now, this is if you do not have any environment. But now, if I were to add an environment to it, they showed that there would be a, an influence functional which would be generated where this influence functional would be dependent on the system path. This analytically calculated it for various examples. And the largest class that we know the answer for is a class of harmonic oscillators, harmonic oscillator bars. Now, we understand that this is not always the case. So for anharmonic or atomistic environments, there are various approaches. Either you can try to do some semi-classical approximation to this influence functional, or 
you can simply invoke the central limit theorem where if you have sufficient number of uh, uh, completely independent degrees of freedom, then effectively they all conspire together to act as a harmonic bath. And you can characterize the harmonic bath using, using the spectral density. Now, it would uh, I would like to note over here that the influence functional is an analog of, uh, of the memory kernel, though not exactly the same as the memory kernel. So we know how to calculate this. All right. This Yes, please. Hi. It's a quick question on the previous yeah, slide. Oh. We are showing the connection. So the coefficients which connects uh, to the nth minus one straight, if yeah. you have path integral formalism, uh, these number of states are still fixed. As I go from T1 to Tn, uh -huh. time steps in the integration. Right. Number of connecting points are not changing. Uh, it's a stationary kind of thing. Uh, it, it depends. So if it, so, you're asking whether I keep the number of points constant or whether I keep the delta t delta constant, t. right? So generally, for most of these simulations, we keep delta t constant, and there are ways of you know you yeah, just but keep will changing. Yeah, will it be it. the case, or so, there will be a, actually a variation in this uh, scale as well? There is a lot. Uh, so so the reason why we do this is is that there is a largest delta t. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, you actually, in terms of jargon, I've been scolded about that. I'll stay away. <laughs> but, but in terms of jargon, it, you incur an error for larger delta t's uh -huh. because of the tr Suzuki trotter splitting, and you want to minimize that. So you want to go small, but if you go small, the length of the memory increases, the effective memory length increases. So you kind of balance the right. two, and you try to get at the yeah. Thanks. All right. Anything else? No. All right. Uh, so let me see uh, where was I. So th these calculations now are not happening in continuous space. We are not doing continuous, sorry, they're not happening in continuous time domain. So uh, when we talk about, a, uh, about the amplitude of a path x of t, x of t as a function does not exist. What happens is you are actually thinking of discretizing these paths uh, at various different time points and these uh, dashed uh, black lines at those discretized points. And effectively, a path then becomes a sequence x of x sub j. And you're talking about the amplitude of such a sequence. And this you can think of as a tensor, because now this amplitude is indexed by the positions of this uh, particle at various time points, x0, x1, up to xn. And and the entire path integral calculation then becomes a gigantic reduction, a, a contraction over these tensors, these path amplitude tensors. And the question is, how do we make this more efficient? Now, um, generally, there were a lot of other methods that, that have been tried over the years. Uh, and around uh, during my postdoc, I was playing around with BMRG. Uh, that is where I got introduced to the concept of tensor networks. And, Actually, the way it happened was that, uh, I mean, in, historically, is that tensor networks were around in the mathematical literature. Uh, Stephen White, in his seminal contribution, when he was defining density matrix renormalization group, which is a method for calculating eigenstates of large systems, he wasn't thinking in terms of tensor networks. He was thinking in terms of renormalization group approaches. However, by the turn of the century, people had begun to realize that there was a very deep connection between these generalized matrix factorization-like things, which we call tensor networks, and, uh, and density matrix renormalization group. In particular, uh, DMRG is related to something called the matrix product state, which I will describe in a moment. But since then, people haven't looked back. Um, there, there is a whole, whole jungle of, density, of uh, tensor factorizations out, uh, out there. And you have various uh, networks which are used for various different purposes. And people have even extended this from structure, as in calculating eigenstates, to time evolving systems. Now, I will give a very short. Uh, I'll skip over this. Yes. Skip over this? Okay, okay, fine. Uh, okay, I'll just go to the results. Skip, 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 skip. I, I didn't realize that I would be this slow. I thought I would just go through and, uh, yeah. So basically, um, the point is, if, if you put two things together like this, the number of external dangling uh, bonds, the number of dangling vertices, um, edges, sorry, 
show you what the rank of this tensor is. So if, a, if you have one dangling edge, that's a vector. If you have two dangling edges, that's a, uh, that's a matrix, three third order uh, tensors, so on and so forth. Uh, see, if you have a multiplication, you have one internal edge, which counts for nothing. Uh, you have only one da uh, dangling edge. So this is topologically the same as the vector. So, and we know matrix times vector is a vector. Last I checked, so yeah. Uh, now, Using this, we can start to think about decomposing this path uh, path amplitude tensor, uh, which has n of these uh, indices. So you, you have an n edged tensor. And what you do is you, you look at them as one edge as the row index and everything else as the column index and do an SVD. And you can, you can incorporate the singular value in whichever uh, part of the matrix as you want to. And so this leads to that. And you can repeatedly now do this. You take the second one and you split it apart and you get this. This is these are truncated singular value decompositions, and you can you can do this, and this is what turns out to be a matrix product state representation of the path amplitude tensor. And this can be used in other places. It's not specific to the path amplitude tensor, but yeah. And here each of these indices are time ordered. Because remember that in the path amplitude tensor out here, your x0, x1, xn. The, the indices are time indices. So those are the indices that come, come down over here. So these are all time ordered indices. And um, this was this idea taking, copying it from, from electronic structure land and other, other places of structure uh, was first done by Lovett in, and, and they managed to figure out how to combine it. Uh, since then, uh, for instance, I have shown that it, it's not necessary to just have a matrix product state. You can do other things. And for really extended systems, I don't think I'll have the time to discuss this today. Uh, it is possible. Uh, it is possible to actually now do a So right now we were decomposing along the time axis, the temporal axis. You can do a 2D decomposition along space and time to obtain another tensor network which can handle really long systems. Uh, they can be used for quantum correlation functions, so on and so forth. A lot of things can be done. Now back to this. Um, so the fenner matthew olsen complex, uh, there have been a lot of work that has been done in trying to figure out what the Hamiltonian, the system Hamiltonian should be and what the, uh, what the system uh, vibration, system protein interaction characterization should be or the spectral density. Uh, some recent work um, has characterized it using some uh, density functional level of theory, some empirical level of theory. And this is the best match that they could get with, uh, with experimental fluorescence line narrowing spectrum. But that is what we are working with. In that paper, this is uh, Ulrich Kleinekartioffer's work, uh, his group. They had done some wave packet dynamics, some method that they call ensemble average wave packet dynamics. And we decided to do the full uh, quantum simulation. And at 300 Kelvin, these, these, these are the population evolution graphs that we got. Uh, you would see two lines per color. The colors refer to the different chromophores. And the initial excitation is on, uh, on chromophore 1. And you can see the evolution of this po excitation population as a function of time. Uh, the dashed line, if you remember, I was saying that the chemical environment can be different between each of these chromophores. So what I wanted to look at was what was the importance of this spatial inhomogeneity. Right, so the dashed line takes care. The dashed lines over here take care of the spatial inhomogeneity. So every uh, chromophore is in a distinct environment. The solid line is if you took an average environment for all of these chromophores, then what happened? Now, the spectral density you're taking from that start, or you are computing? Uh, so I'm not computing. So uh, we go up in the data from there. So this is the average average spectral density, average across all the eight monomers. Um, so that so this uh, line, the black line over here, would correspond to the solid lines here. Um, and and then uh, and this is going back to whether it's quantum classical, not quantum, not classical. That debate. We also can do incoherent Fiosta theory. And if you notice that the rough time scales are once again the same. How important is spatial inhomogeneity? I would say rather not. Yes, you can see some effect of inhomogeneity right over here at the very short times where the transport from uh, chromophore number one to two is happening. It seems to be sped up. It seems to be slowed down by, uh, by, by the uh, spatial inhomogeneities being present, but effectively they're identical, right? 
And one other thing to notice over here, this has been known in the literature for some time, that it is, uh, it is chromophore number three, which leaks into the reaction center for this, this uh, phenomathy olson complex. And if you notice the time evolution for, uh, for, for, uh, for the population on chromophore 3, it's identical for whether you take in the, uh, the spatial inhomogeneities or don't take in the spatial inhomogeneities, nothing matters. All right. Oh, sorry. The gaps are different. The gaps are different. The, uh, the couplings are different. This is a non-nearest neighbor coupling. They're all to all coupled. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the sp uh, spectral densities are different. Even the bath is the bath is different for the da dashed lines. The bath is same for the solid lines, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. some states in your law of information, non Markovian law. Right. The solving interpersonality is same. Right. So now the observable quality isn't that the there's an additional spread will arise because of this unharmonic effects. Um. So if I, if I understand correctly, you are modeling the black lines. Over there. Up there? Here, you're saying? Yeah. So I'm not modeling. So I'm using the black lines, or effectively, let's say. But you will go uh, pretty close. No, no. My goal is to use the black lines because the calculating the black line is not easy, but significantly easier than doing the full dynamics on the full thing, right? The black line imagines that your, uh, that, that your electronic state is fixed, and then you're running the vibrations on that electronic state, right? But in real dynamics, it's not that. Everything is coupled and they're entangled, right? So now we are using those black lines to characterize the bath and using it to define what the population evolution would be for the, for, for the electronics. You can, you can, or, or as long as your observables are dependent only on the electronic degree of freedom. So things like population dynamics, uh, oh, sorry, my bad, oops. Oh no, oh no. Yeah, There's something like population dynamics over here. Uh, say you're looking at spectra. All of those are just electronic quantities, so you would be getting everything, right? And this is not Monte Carlo, at least what I'm doing is not Monte Carlo, so there is no statistical uh, error bars. Right. Okay. So now, for this calculation, for instance, yes. Okay. Can you also calculate the coherence between the sets? Yes. That yes. 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 Absolutely. We, we are we are propagating the full density matrix. Um, while I I don't have the data for the thing, right? Yeah. But, but I have got an interesting addendum to that uh, actually. But yeah. So so for this kind of calculation, if you didn't have any of these uh, tensor network based methods or other developments, you would be summing over something like sixty four to the power fifty one parts or 10 to the power 92. I don't even know if that is possible. Okay, now we, we understand that this is how, how the population, eh, sorry, my bad. We understand that this is how the population dynamics looks. An essential question to uh, answer is how did, does it get there, right? If you look at something like two picoseconds, at two picoseconds, you have a certain population for third side, certain population for the second side, so on and so forth. And you know that at zero picosecond, at the initial time, you had one for the first sight and zero for everything else. Now the question is, how did that exciton go from this set, set to state to the, uh, the other uh, later time point? So we want to understand the roots of exciton, excitation transfer. Please, how will change your sites? location. Yes, yes. So are you thinking of just relabeling the sites or just moving it? Oh, well, then it's just a relabeling, right? And then what will happen is that the spectral densities would be relabeled. That's a different yeah, exactly. So the sites of the chromophores. This is a, okay. Okay, the spectral density it, it comes as a Fourier transform of uh, of the interaction energy. If, if I may be very vague, it comes as a Fourier transform of the interaction. Actually, experimentally. Oh, experimentally. Yeah. Experimentally, it is it is closely related to multiple things. Uh, this is being uh, compared over here to fluorescence line narrowing spectra. I'm not entirely sure how it is done. Uh, I know that, for instance, if you think of something like uh, uh, Stokes shift or anti-Stokes shift, right? These shifts are related to your spectral density. Fluorescence line narrowing spectra is in some manner related to the spectral density, so on and so forth. <laughs> 
Yes, it is effectively probing how the interaction between the whatever you're considering the system and the environment is. Uh, Okay, 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 okay. Right, 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 right. So yes. So experimentally you can't. Experimentally, what you see is an average fluorescence line narrowing spectrum. The the site dependent one, the one which is spatially inhomogeneous, that was a theory calculation. Right? And the other thing is yeah, yeah, okay. I didn't, I didn't understand that properly. Yes, and the other thing is that the fluorescence line narrowing spectrum, while it gets the high energy uh, peaks proper, it doesn't have the Brownian portion. Uh, I mean, th there are lots of Brownian motion modes which which will give you this broad featureless spectrum. So those are not generally probed by, as far as I understand, by the fluorescence line narrowing spectrum. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I. It seems like it is an incredibly difficult problem to uh, to get at the correct spectral density for these complexes. People do th theoretically, experimentally, you get some things right, but but that is also not the whole picture because uh, if you just have the high frequency modes, you don't know how the low frequency modes would be reacting. Structure, the experiment. Yes, yes, that could be, uh, as Jyotish Manda was saying, if it's a low temperature uh, experiment, then, then you won't have as much broadening. So you would be able to distinguish between the peaks much better, right? So so that that, that would be one of the things, but but I wouldn't lay much emphasis on the, on the level of theory. It's all not good. All right. Uh, yeah, so it would be nice to be able to figure out the roots of exciton transport. And people have been interested in this, in this, yeah, I'll speed up really. Um, uh, people have been interested in this for some time, but most of the approaches that people have taken are uh, are pretty much, uh, if if you have a ha if all you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail kind of an approach. So what they, uh, one of the seminal works, which I feel is probably one of the more elegant ones, says that, okay, I've got say eight, 10, whatever number of sites. I want to understand what are the important routes of transport. So let me do something. Uh, I'll do the full calculation and let me kick out one site or one chromophore at a time and then multiple chromophores at a time. If these chromophores happen to be along an important uh, important route, then of course there would be a huge change in the dynamics. And consequently, you will say that, okay, that the route must go through that particular chromophore. If it doesn't change much, then that, that chromophore isn't important. However, this suffers from a very uh, critical flaw that uh, these changes are not perturbative in nature. So we, I do not quite understand if you have a firm uh, theoretical fundamental basis on being able to compare the dynamics of two systems which, with different number of chromophores, different everything, right? That's a huge change. And consequently, we were actually thinking about how to address this problem. And um, we came up with a way which, okay, the, 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 there are other things that we, one could in principle do. One could say, for instance, if, that the, uh, if the Hamiltonian element connecting two sites is large, then the transition along that pathway would be large. However, that misses out on the solvent contribution now. What we were able to do is decouple the decouple the, the entire population dynamics in terms of flows along all the unmediated pathways between two chromophores. So if you think about, uh, about this entire thing as a graph, where each of the chromophore is, an, is a vertex, and they're connected by edges, then I can now decouple the population that goes along every edge from the total reduced density matrix as a function of time. And if I do that, then I have the full uh, time evolution of, of all these unmediated transfer, and I can talk about stuff. So the first and the least interesting thing of all to look at is a static picture of the pathways. And we can define the static picture as, as something like a time average of the amount that has flown along any of these edges. So if you see, uh, let's just talk about the top row because the bottom row is about an, a different initial condition. But the top row, let's start with the left graph. This says, at any point of time, if I'm at 
a particular column uh, at the chromophore labeled by the column, then what is the propensity for me to travel to the chromophore labeled by the row? So you're, of course, as I'm saying that you're starting with the with an initial condition of one. So you're starting from first column. Red is high uh, propensity to travel to that particular row. Blue is the reverse. So the travel is in the reverse direction. So you can see that one goes to two. Okay, then what happens with two? You come to the second column and you see that that goes to three. Now, once you're at three, eesh, once you're at three, you really don't go anywhere because you see that for the third column, everything is blue, which means that all other sites are dumping into the third chromophore and nothing is leaking out. So on and so forth. You can figure out all the other pathways and what is the contribution just by looking at this. Now, this calculation takes into account the full solvent effects because we are processing. It's a post-processing of the density matrix as we understand it. And we see that for Fiosto's theory, you have pretty much the, the most important contributions are very similar. However, there are differences in the more delicate parts. For instance, the, you can see over here that there is some direct transport from one to three, this little square. However, here there is absolutely no direct transport, so on and so forth. This can be analyzed ad, ad nauseum. But this is not the strength of the method. The strength of the method lies in being able to dynamically ascertain the pathways, which we have been able to do for a foresight model, mostly because you can imagine the number of uh, unmediated transports for an eight-site model would go as eight squared, which is absolutely miserable. But for four, it's possible to do. And you can, you can take the dynamics over here and you can break it up into the contribution. So you can see here I'm plotting the change of the population of site one. That is the black curve. And the black curve is basically the blue curve after subtracting one, the initial population from it. And we have been able to uh, partition this population transfer amongst the change due to the second molecule, which is the red curve, the change due to the third molecule, which is the green curve, and the change due to the fourth molecule, which is the blue curve, whatever. So effectively, what happens is you can see that uh, the initial precipitous drop over here is only due to first chromophore leaking into the second chromophore. However, after that, you can see a change in the rate at which that leakage is taking place. And by that time, something like one to four is getting becoming more. The, the transport from one to four. And thus you can decompose the full dynamics. I think I will, I will stop at this point. There are other methods for, for uh, doing extended systems which can be applied to spin transport and so on and so forth. Uh, the conclusions are, we don't, don't need to always talk about whether it's quantum or classical coherence. That may not be the most fruitful question to ask. Uncontrolled approximations need to be benchmarked against uh, numerically exact simulations for them to be believed. Uh, we are trying to push towards uh, larger systems and, and uh, dynamical pathways, trying to keep the, uh, keep the methods most general. That is the goal. And I would like to acknowledge TIFR for, for giving me this opportunity and, and the fun that I have had over the last year or so. Some of the work which I haven't presented was done at, uh, at Princeton during my postdoc. And uh, some of the work has been done with Peter, my friend Peter. Yeah. And I'd like to thank you all for, for your okay. attention. And, and I have really used up my time. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Amoto. Um, we'll have time for questions, more questions. Yeah. More questions, perfect. Uh, okay. Well, okay, okay. okay. I will someone else. Yeah, yeah. So you said it's a tight binding model, right? Effectively. And yes. then you are coupling it to a bath. So it's essentially yeah. a non-interacting model between the chromophores. I mean, it's a hopping, but tight binding model. So if it was just a tight binding model, it would be a non-interacting model because you can directly mm -hmm. diagonalize it. However, uh, with the bath being present, getting the bath would be uh, difficult because you will have Actually, something like... Actually, it is not. So, okay. so because, you know, at the path integral level, it remains a Gaussian problem. Even when you integrate out the bath, Right, right. It does. It does. And yeah. then every Gaussian models do not have, you know, the complexity of two to the power eight. It's just a matrix inversion that will give you. You have to do it at every time and so on. Right. There is a complexity right. related the two to, to the power that. Eight. Yes, the two to the power eight thing is actually also not fair. You are absolutely right because for most of these, you are stuck in yeah. the. In, in, in eight, the, basically, eight, yeah, eight, 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 eight. 
Yeah. And so eight, yeah. right? The, the the reason I started with that, I didn't have time to do that block yeah. diagonalization bit. But yeah. the reason why I was emphasizing the two to the power eight is because uh, at some point of time, you also want to be able to do spin chains. So you want to do something like a transfer. So it's a actually. different question. Absolutely. But in this, in this, in this it is you, you are working in the yeah. yes. Okay. You are working in the end state. Thank you. There's one more thing I would like to add to this is that uh, the problem with this end thing is that uh, you wouldn't be able to do multi photon processes. As soon as you have two photon processes, you you, will, you have to go to the two excited, doubly excited subspace, which is n choose two. Yeah, so that's yeah. It. You know, going back to the experiment, yes. you're saying that I'm exciting a part of the molecule, and the energy then transported to a different part of the molecule. Is that the basic premise? Yes, that is the premise okay. that we are studying. So yes. how do I? So I must have a distinct way of recognizing that the fluorescence is coming from a different part of the molecule. Mm -hmm. Is that what is observed? Um, I'm not entirely or, sure how these. Let, let, I can imagine. Tested. I can give you the lattice example. This right. called site selected excitation, and mm -hmm. you can detect. So you dope one ion here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You excite that, and then you have another ion many sites away mm -hmm. by structure. Right. Then right. I excite this, and that guy fluoresces. Right. So I know that the energy is actually gone. Right. So, right? so, yes. so these were all the earlier experiments done, including mm -hmm. fluorescence line narrowing, mm -hmm. where they used extremely sharp laser lights mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to. Home in on the specific right, excitation right, right, right. and then look at how it is propagating. Right. So, so what is the experimental measure of this transport? I'm not entirely certain of that. Uh, Maybe JD. Uh, yeah. Can no. Throw some they, light. They do the experiment where they can actually see whether the emission is coming out of the last chromosome. Yeah. Okay. So different so place. It be a different place. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, this one, the first one, and that is excited, distinct. That is distinct. One. Okay. The third one, it just becomes the third one before it transfers to the right. electron center. Okay. So, and I, I believe some measure like that. Yes. 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 And yes. I believe you, you might also be able to track the number of electrons coming out of the third site. Can uh, you? I don't know. Electrons, you can't. It's just optical experiment. Okay. Yeah, right, so, right. So, right. so you'll have to look so at some What kind. is really interesting is that, you know, going back to this, mm -hmm. when there is so much of vibrational excitation at room temperature, normally we think that coherence is destroyed in right, right, no right. time. Yeah. What is remarkable is that, you know, if it survives, then it's very robust, whatever is being created. Right. So it survives uh, random excitation, double bath at 300 Kelvin. But, but, but at least, uh, at least, it, it, it is, these are all, these are all. But you're talking about, not 20 Kelvin is the experiment, but they began by saying that, you know, do we need a quantum coherence? Yeah. So no, there no. must have been some hint of what they were saying. So, so, 20 so, Kelvin is but, okay. But the problem, yes, 20 Kelvin is okay. Sounds more reasonable. But at three, there are multiple things. I, I do not know. I think there was another experimental paper which said that they reanalyzed the same thing and they couldn't spot that yes. uh, that, that oscillation, okay. right? <laughs> so <laughs> that could be one part. I do not know if that is true. But there's I'm, 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 kind of analyzed in a different way. Yes. So, so to look at that. Right. And, and issues with that. Very yeah. interesting. And, and for instance, what Miller showed is that even if you have those oscillations, it's not necessary that that's quantum coherence. Do you yeah. yeah. Okay. Was it the PNAS paper yes. from 2017? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. It's okay. okay. And yeah, show it also. Okay. But first, because we did that. You didn't ask question. <laughs> uh, yeah. So in your, uh, this eight site complex, the energy is dumped initially in site one and then from site three, it's getting transferred. So that's what you're showing in the population level as well. Right. What right. was my question was about the site three transfer the energy to uh, reaction center. Yes. Uh, yes. And that is probably will also going to happen continuously and might have an impact on the population. Did you model that? And how so, does that so, affect yes, the Yes. Uh, going towards that, in pushing in those directions is one of the goals. So this can be done in multiple ways. The cheating way is to say that there is an on-site non-hermeticity which just leaks out all the energy, which is absolutely trash. What else you can do is you can actually parameterize the reaction center in terms of whatever moieties are there, and then include include it as a part of a larger uh, a larger system solvent like simulation. Could this happen that once you include this reaction center, then all these graphs change? Uh, then your your hop like energy transfer thing you showed, right? It, yeah, One you, to two, two to three. That path could change, or um, that's not possible. The, the, the pathway would uh, the pathway won't qualitatively change, but the exact graphs would would surely change. 
I, at least that's what I feel, right? Um, yeah, but I don't think, I mean, I would be surprised if say, over here we are seeing one to two, two to three being the major pathway. I wouldn't expect that to change all of a sudden and some other pathway to become most important. Thank you. But, but that could be different. Yes. Sorry, just quickly, uh, just out of curiosity. I mean, if I were to just model the environment in the statistical mechanical sets, like a canonical and some energy transfer. Right, result, right. This is a right. So the result that I would get, I mean, is there a way to distinguish that? If the, Can the experiment inform me, no, this is not enough, and you need to have this kind of a non-Markovian uh, process where you take into account path integral and the phases? Um, is important. Um, uh, so, so you, you're modeling the bath in the same way, but what you're uh, yeah, if I bath understand I'm you're, saying what Rajdeep was saying, it basically is like a huge thermal thermal distribution. Yeah, it's a thermal distribution, right? Mechanics, Absolutely. So you have a bath. Now, all of these approximations. So I, I, I think we were discussing the Born approximation, or if you say it's not non-Markovian, it's a Markovian. All of these would deviate your results from the true result. Now, whether the deviation is low, yes. 300 Kelvin. At 300 Kelvin, whether that is important. Oh, but let's say not 300, but even is there an experimental way to inform me as a modeler? Oh, oh, I do, I, do, that is, uh, do I need to go uh, this or should I? Yeah, no, no, that's a that very, is. that's very interesting. No, I, I'm just asking like. I, yeah, no, no, I, I think that is a very interesting I, okay. question. Yeah. 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 Sentence. Yes, you can, unless, unless only this so, and C has yes. A so the thing is, the bandwidth of the laser has to be very sharp, you, because it's a pulse laser. Unfortunately, right. you can't do that to a certain extent. Right. So, right. Yes. Right. Right. Those are few. No, no, no. They're they're one nanometer right. separated. Right. Yeah. 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 You can. You can in principle. <laughs> the spectral signatures are slightly different. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we had had a fantastic discussion. So thank you, uh, Amartya, for this thank wonderful for colloquium. Um, and, um, and 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 let's all walk with Amartya to have some snacks um, outside West Canteen. So thank you very much, and thank you everyone in the AV group for putting the putting the YouTube uh, link together. Thank you, Najapa. Yeah. Thank you very much. Chais. <laughs> oh, right, right. Once you get excited, you have to transport yourself. Fantastic.